Good afternoon, everyone. The beginning of the APPI luncheons always mean that, means that winter is coming. Um, but in our case, it's very fond memories of our, of our winter holidays. So this is kind of a, a geeked out family slideshow because there was no way that Peter and I were going to be able to travel to these places and of course our decision even to go there in the winter has everything to do with with who we are and how we show up in our professional lives. Our professional lives are very much stitched into into who we are. So um, as a family we have two teenagers Mira and Evan who are 17 and 15. We decided that we wanted to go on an unusual winter holiday and the kids were good sports. So um, as Mark said, we didn't go to some of the Nordic nations, we went to all of the Nordic nations and we chose to go to the capital cities. Um, it was hard to not go see the rest of those countries, but we just kind of knew that our mission, you know, over three weeks was to get a sense of these five cities and notice what we notice about them. So um, as we put it for the title of our, of our thing, it's about Northern Delight and maybe the Nordic nations just might be in the dark when it comes to winter city design. That was kind of the question we went with. And we're just going to play with that question over the course of the presentation. So our story um, simply is we wanted to go and check those places out. And of course, there are some fun facts that you folks will all be interested in before we get into what we, what we saw and what we learned. So very simply, at the bottom of this table is Edmonton, because Edmonton is the furthest south of the six cities that are on this table. Reykjavik is the furthest north, and we've highlighted in bold some key things, such as the amount of sunlight in Reykjavik on December 21st is 17 minutes, compared to two hours and 34 minutes of sunlight in Edmonton. And the, the daylight hours are four hours and 28 minutes as opposed to seven and a half hours for us. So that's a big, that's a big difference. So we noticed that when we were there that the window of, of daylight hours was smaller, particularly when we were at Reykjavik. The temperature was also quite a bit different. All of these cities are close to ocean, much closer than we are, so it's, it's, it's tempered by that. Whereas we're fully and completely landlocked. So if you look at the high and the low temperature, in December, Edmonton may be minus 6, minus 15 is the low. Reykjavik was plus 2 and minus 2. And when we got there, there'd been a huge dump of snow, but it was about minus 2 and it was melting. And like the dump of snow was about like this. So the city you would think would be shut down, but everybody's got killer winter tires, they drive around, nothing stops, and they just keep going. And in fact, I hazard to guess in one of the main streets in Reykjavik, it's actually heated because there's no way the snow would just miraculously disappear and just be a wet street. So that's a very different thing when you're living on Volcano Island, that there's this thermal heat that's already always readily accessible. With the temperature thing, because this is the thing us folks in Edmonton on the prairies always say that we can't compare these winter cities to ours because they're warmer. Yes, they're warmer, but they're also far more humid. And I'll tell you that a day outside at minus 11 in Reykjavik felt very, very cold. So it's very different. What we have, though, is we have sunshine. So if, even if it's minus 20, we have sunshine. So a little bit of facts there. Here's a, a view of Copenhagen from the Round Tower, if anybody's been there. And you can just see that this city is very different than Edmonton. It's older, there's a medieval feel to this. The scale is completely different than how we have built our city because it's, it's far more recent. Here's a little bit of information because I had to geek out on this a little bit. I went, particularly when I got home because it felt so different there, I wanted to better understand what this was all about. So this is just simply the population. So Stockholm is much more populated than Edmonton and these are um, an urban agglomeration of population. So this is a calculation of just simply looking at the built up area and how many people are living in it. So in the urban area in Edmonton, which would include things like Sherwood Park and St. Albert, the comparison of Stockholm is over two million people. And you can see that Copenhagen and Oslo is kind of similar to Edmonton and Calgary, but Copenhagen and Stockholm were, were much bigger. And Reykjavik is just a small city. So that's the population. The area, in contrast, is quite a bit different. The area in which that population lives Edmonton is really high 
and Calgary is quite high. Um, Reykjavik was really low also because it was smaller. And then you, you can just see that um, the other cities are, are consume much less land also. So then the next question is, what's the density? So that is very instructive. To me it was around um, Oslo and Reykjavik and Stockholm in particular are far more densely populated than what we're familiar with here. And when you go back to that image I showed you of Copenhagen, when it's four, six stories everywhere, not just every once in a while, that totally and completely changes the shape of how the city feels, how it looks, how many people are living there. So that's just part of the context of how these cities compare to ours. They're all more densely populated. Um, but there aren't a whole bunch of buildings that are really, really, really tall either. So we have four categories of things that we noticed make a great place for winter. And the first one of those is that it is, is, is all about accessibility. And here's a shot in Copenhagen. This is Boxing Day in Copenhagen. And it has rained, or not rained, it has snowed the night before and already this path that you see where the cyclist is, is already cleared. They cleared the bike path before they cleared the sidewalk. There's not a lot of snow here, but it's, it's, uh, it's probably about minus three, minus four. So it's crispy and icy. So clearly it's a priority for them to clear that, that infrastructure off. The other thing you need to know is that path that the bicycle on, is like a sidewalk. It's the, the in terms of cross section, you've got the street and it pops up, and the bike lane. It, it's simply they've changed the the paving material so that you can tell and differentiate where the bike lane is and where the pedestrians are. But it's basically a sidewalk. It's ridiculously simple infrastructure. That makes it very accessible. People of every age were using this. So this is an older fellow. There's another feller fellow beho behind him, and the bicycle behind. You'll see in a moment. The other thing about accessible infrastructure is places to put your bikes. And of course, if you've got more bikes happening, there's going to be infrastructure put in. This is just outside the train station. So it was very clear that people rode their bike to the train station to go where they were going for their holiday and then come back and get on their bike and go back to their, go back to their home. But on the, on the left-hand side of the screen are, are bicycles that you can rent and on the right hand side are the local residents bicycles. So they've just built in all over the place ways for people to just get out and about on your bicycle. This is a, a photograph in Oslo and it was absolutely stunning to me as a pedestrian on a, on a street. This street had the most insane integration of modes of transportation. So on the sidewalk where I took the picture are pedestrians and bicyclists. In the roadway is the blue um, train, a little gray car, and the red trolley bus, all integrated into the same thing. Because at this point, at this point in the city, there's you know there's an integration and a mesh of all the different modes of transportation, and it just showed up all at once here with the car, the train, the bus, and then of course we're pedestrians, and it just and and, and the. The ease and use of all of these transportation facilities was also ridiculously easy. In Helsinki, um, on this street, this is one of the prime shopping districts, and there are no vehicles. We didn't, I don't think we saw any vehicles in this street, but there are trolley buses that run, and they're just built into the street. You can cross the street. There's major pedestrian corridors on either side in terms of the sidewalks. All of the stores along the side are connected into inside, not shopping malls as we would know it, but older buildings that somehow have turned into corridors and <laughs> paths for people to go shopping. But there was never only one point with which you could enter onto the street. It was very, the buildings were permeable. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But the streetcar, you can see just a raised sidewalk. The streetcar pulls up. Folks can get on and off and get on with their shopping. You could get on the streetcar and go a couple blocks away if you were feeling cold. But also, clearly, what people were doing is just popping inside and outside of, of buildings and stores while they were enjoying the out, outside. And this was one of those days where it was probably about minus 10, minus 11. And you shop outside, and when you need to warm up, you can go inside. But the choice wasn't be inside or be outside. It was, it was beautifully accessible. The other feature of the cities, in addition to being accessible, really encouraged people to be active. 
So in Stockholm, an absolutely beautiful skating rink in the middle of a public square downtown. You could rent skates if you didn't have skates. We brought skates with us and we didn't use them because it was too warm in Oslo and et cetera, et cetera. And by the time we found this skating rink, we were way far away from our skates, which was kind of too bad. But absolute beautiful settings. We, of course, do not have a palace to overlook a skating rink, but <laughs> that's just the way it is for us. Also, little skating rinks in places. Um, but in this picture, when we're taking the picture behind us, is a little tiny rink, and there's a hot dog, not a hot dog, a hot chocolate concession. So you can stop and enjoy. This was also Boxing Day in Copenhagen. So get a hot chocolate, just enjoy being outside. This day was sunshine, so they're lucky they had some, and it was a beautiful day to enjoy as a family. We did get to go skiing when we were in Oslo. And in Oslo from downtown, well, from virtually anywhere in Oslo, you can get on a train and you can take this train. It just feels like you're so in Norway. And you go up through the city, a hundred year old track that takes a train up to where the ski jumping takes place. It goes a little further. You jump off the train, you get on a little shuttle bus, and then you're at a ski hill. So we skied, but here's, the, here's an indicator about how the temperature is different. There is no ski chalet. So this is the concession at, at the ski hill. It's outside where you can, at the waffle boden, and you can get your waffles or your hot dogs or what have you. And there was no need to go inside and warm up because it obviously doesn't, doesn't get that cold. But it really makes for an exciting outside place to be able to just walk up with other people and eat your hot dog outside. In Copenhagen, this is again, this is another beautiful place for tobogganing and it's again, we do not have beautiful grounds around a palace, but people of all ages flock to this place on Boxing Day to go tobogganing. There were people tobogganing with kids who are adults who have no kids. It was absolutely beautiful and you can get there on the bike path and you'll notice this gal has a toboggan and a kid behind her. So this is, this is how people got to the toboggan hill. That's how integrated and active the infrastructure is, is if you can put your kid on the back of your bike, grab a little plastic toboggan, and go to that toboggan hill. The other fast, this is winter busking. So this is also active too, right, in a way, or it engages you with the world around you a little bit differently when there's a snow palace with candles. And that was busking. There was, you know, an ask for donations when you when you walked by, much the same way you would experience a busker who is doing some kind of a perf musical performance, say, right? And then there is the programming of absolutely spectacular fireworks and dance and music at Senate Square in Helsinki. We didn't plan this, but we happened to be there for the International Light Festival, and this is a, a fireworks group from Berlin that was performing that was absolutely stunning. And everybody stood outside, and it was minus 10, human mi humid minus 10, and watched this for about 50 minutes, and it was unbelievable. So that's kind of cool, too. And in Helsinki also, there is the beautiful Hakamieni Square, and every Sunday outside there is a market. Every, every day inside in a building next door to this, there's a market on the inside. But on the outside on Sunday, they roll in the trailers, they've all got a little bit of heating, and it's a, it's a beautiful gathering in the middle of winter on a cold day to still have the market outside. There's no reason why we couldn't try that kind of thing here. In Copenhagen, this is one of the streets, when you hear about Copenhagen, that it didn't always used to be about bicycles. It did always used to be about cars. This is one of those streets that they, they physically shut down for cars. I don't recommend this in just about any circumstance because we don't have the population density to pull it off. I look at examples like Spark Street in Ottawa, and it is frankly for me a way to kill a street. When you've got the density and stuff happening, this is a bold way to just like, this is, you know, probably December 27th, and it's absolutely packed with people. Of course, they're shopping. They don't do the Boxing Day shopping like we do, so it's, don't imagine that that's what this is. It's people out and about walking, maybe not shopping, but fully enjoying the city, and it feels really good, and they decorate it. They make sure that there's something at the edge of the buildings and the plazas 
that so it's not just a stark inside outside thing but there's cafes that start to bleed out into the square and knit the people that are in the square with the with the businesses that are around and even when it's really cold we didn't see the kids playing in the sandbox but we saw evidence of the kids having played in the sandbox on a cold day because those toys work just as well with snow as they do in sand and when there's not too much snow you can get at the sand and still have fun so the first two things that we learned were about being accessible and active and oh there's one more here I thought I was at the end so <laughs> So in Helsinki, this is one of the new developments that they're, they're constructing in the inner part of the city that used to be an industrial area. And there's a little sliver of, of light and sunshine that has melted the snow on the soccer field. And there are kids out there playing soccer. And in crazy parks, they even build things for people to be active like a boxing ring. <laughs> and in the winter, you still can, you still can play and have fun there. All right. So the other, as Beth, as Beth mentioned, there's sort of we, we sort of saw four components of the city that we thought uh, contributed to good winter city design. So I'm going to talk about the social dimension, and I'll just say quickly, as a designer, I'm very interested in all the things they've taught us in school about how to make a great winter city. And what you're going to see in these slides are examples of, while there are examples of uh, design impacting uh, the, the public realm. There's lots of examples of really simple things that are done that do just as much to animate the streetscape and are probably in some ways more valuable and, and more interesting. So this is actually the slide that follows the, uh, the boxing ring. This is a very large linear park through Copenhagen. That has been, there's a whole design scenario behind it. I won't, I won't get into it, but a, a huge dimension of it is providing opportunities for people to just get together. This is a very high density neighborhood, not a lot of open space, and this really uh, uh, provides that function for the people who live here. So again, this was not a, a super cold day, but it, there was activity everywhere in, in terms of people getting together, having a barbecue, getting to know their neighbor. Um, this kind of speaks for itself. Swings that again are used no matter what the temperature is. People just hanging out and having a good time. So again, this is these are examples of conscious design interventions. But the thing that was really interesting are all the things that are done to animate the streetscape that are really not about design. It's about shopkeepers creating spaces for people to sit outside. And this is in Oslo, this is a heated space. Even just well-designed benches and the placement of benches for people to sit and socialize. We didn't always see people outside eating, but we saw a lot of places that were set up ready for people to have a cup of coffee, have a glass of wine. They were set up to invite you to sit down and to have a drink or a cup of coffee. So just the intention of putting something out there, even if it's not used, really animates <coughs> the street and makes it much, much more inviting. So another example from Copenhagen. Um, this is a really interesting slide because it was in the middle of absolutely nowhere. This is one of the new areas in Copenhagen which is probably as badly designed as anywhere in the world. Uh, very low density, huge amounts of space between buildings, no pedestrian orientation, but yet uh, this restaurant decided to put out some very interesting seats and, and lights that would otherwise um, cast the streetscape in a very dark and unappealing way. <coughs> Uh, lighting is huge, not surprisingly, so again, to invite uh, use and access in, into buildings. Uh, just some other examples of, in Oslo, again, putting blankets out, candles out. Again, these were all set up, and at the end of the night, there may not have been anyone that had sat and used it, but the difference it makes to the perception of the streetscape is pretty substantial. And of course, we all know about color in the winter landscape. Here's an example the decoration of store windows and again that interaction with the streetscape again not something that's designed it's the uh, intention of the shop owner to make a contribution so that covered off things that are again kind of a mix between planning and, and design and, and shopkeepers getting involved the last one here is kind of just straight up architectural design all the things that you've heard about that can animate the winter landscape and the word we gave it was was delight and it's really about detail and texture and color and an examination of do they really work. So we talk about sense of place. Helsinki is very much like northern Alberta and the territories, lots of uh, uh, shield and oak crops. 
So they do a good job of incorporating that into open space. Uh, we did see some examples of sort of light, whimsical things like in Stockholm, just some very temporary structures to house temporary trees to animate this internal streetscape. Uh, the spaces are finely detailed. Um, these are obviously old buildings, old fountains, but again, the interest and in the articulation of these things uh, is very attractive and uh, encourages use and activity. Uh, the use of light and color is something that is uh, really stunning. Um, as Beth mentioned, um, these, these cities get very little sunlight. The sun is usually very low. Um, this is an example, I think it's what, around noon it's or noon. one o'clock or so. And it's just, you know, the very tops of buildings get, get picked up in color. And it's often in, in cities like this, and I don't think there's a slide, unfortunately, uh, buildings with spires and, and sort of iconic buildings. Uh, Stockholm, I think, stood out as, as using a lot of really warm colors. And again, we talk about warm colors and how they're used, and there's some examples of maybe not so good warm colors coming up, but the, the, the combination of the specific color of orange, uh, yellows, even sort of warm greens and sometimes blues with light really make a difference in terms of animating these public spaces. So this is the, this is the place in Helsinki where the, where the soccer pitch was. So these are brand new buildings, uh, experimenting with color, you know, not so bad. They certainly animate, again, the streetscape and, and add some interest and, and vibrancy. Uh, light is, again, like I say, pretty huge over there. This is a chapel in downtown Helsinki. I think it's more stunning at night, but we didn't, we weren't able to get a photo of it. But the interesting thing about light, and it comes back to the comment again about the amount of daylight, uh, especially in Helsinki, it was dark by, what, 3.30 in the afternoon? And the stores are open until 9, 10 o'clock at night. So it's very obvious that they do a bulk of their business or a good chunk of their business in the dark. So uh, correspondingly, the businesses spend a lot of effort and the business associations spend a lot of effort in using light as a way to add interest and uh, vibrancy to streetscapes. So again, these are not great pictures. It's if you don't have the right equipment, it's hard to take good nighttime photos, but it gives you a good sense of, of what we're talking about here. Um, this is a market in downtown Copenhagen. It's actually brand new. It's about three years old. And I think what's interesting about this one is just the amount of transparency in the building, just by virtue of what's inside, animates what's around it, which in, even in this case is not a lot going on. But imagine this building as opposed to a solid wall with no fenestration, no articulation. The difference is pretty substantial. Again, these are images of retail and, and what they do to enliven the streetscape. Uh, this is Stockholm again. The street between the overhead lights and the lights in the buildings just really animated what was going on here. Uh, and then a, a similar street. This is the one in Stockholm that had the, the small triangular uh, tree details. Uh, the use of color and what, what that can do to things. Another one in Stockholm. So really what I guess we're kind of left with is, is we went there and that's a planner, I'm a designer, and I thought I had all the answers and I came back sort of, you know, thinking everything I knew was wrong. Um, but it does, it does force us to ask ourselves a question and I think what, we, what we'd like you to do is think about how we can apply what we've seen to Edmonton. And, you know, we like to kind of sometimes uh, dump on ourselves, but there are great things happening here in terms of animating the Winter City. Uh, what was done last year with the Shake Up uh, Winter Conference was, was great. But we are doing things that make the city more accessible and we can do more. We have great trails, whether they're top of bank and in the valley. We have great infrastructure. It's easy to get bikes that, that work. Uh, we have a good LRT system and a bus system that's, that, that's getting more and more integrated. So the things that Beth talked about in Copenhagen about an integrated system uh, are coming to fruition here. Uh, more active. Now we're probably a bit behind on this, but uh, again, focused efforts to program public space are happening. And uh, again, design has a role, planners obviously have a huge role, and business improvement areas and revitalization zones have a huge uh, role in this as well. Um, more social, I mean, again, the, the lesson from over there is that you don't necessarily need uh, very um, designy kinds of uh, projects. All you need to do is provide a space and provide a, a means for people to animate and to uh, provide areas for people to get together. 
this is our community league and one of the days that they do, I can't remember what day it is, but <coughs> they do a day in the winter and uh, you can see here there's nothing really flashy or fancy but yet it works quite well and all of a sudden you have a chance to build a sense of community and neighborhood. And in terms of delight, um, Edmonton is really doing a great job through some of their urban design initiatives to us raise the bar of architecture and urban design. Um, this is the new, I think it's the library in Millwoods and uh, on a really bright day, actually I was dealing with a broken arm that kept me from going to Reykjavik. Um, I got off the bus in Millwoods and I looked over and there's this beautiful building that just in the right light added a whole other dimension to this winter landscape that would never have been there. So again, color, light, detail, those are all things that I think the city is doing a really good job and we should be encouraging the city to do more of.